Good morning. Good, good morning, Southside. It's good to have you with us this morning. Good to see all of you this morning. Uh, we're going to change some things up just a little bit. Uh, so we're going to show you a video here in just a second. The video is uh, related to our Lightman Christmas offering, and this is an offering that supports our international missionaries. So uh, we want to let you know what's going on around the world with some of our missionaries and their ministry. And if you'd like to give towards the Light of Moon Christmas offering, you can do that through December and January. So we, we extend that offering through the month of January. There's envelopes out there on the off, in the offering box that you can pick up. Uh, but uh, after, the, after the video, then we'll turn it over to, to the worship team then. I take the gift. You know, to us, evangelism and discipleship isn't just like one hour a week meeting with them doing a Bible story or going through the scripture. To us, it's, it's spending life with them. It's living with them, being there with them, and then sharing scripture with them. Just keep sharing the truth with them. streets and people are walking by them constantly. They don't see them. They don't even acknowledge them. They don't talk to them. And so I think God's really opened up a door for us to come into their lives and see them. So we see their needs. We don't look at them as some invisible person or some number or some project. We look at them as made in God's image and people that deserve to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. So we started a project to help us gain access to the American people, and this project helps them provide jobs, and it gives us a reason to be among them and spending time with them so that we can share the gospel with them. So there's one lady that we met through our ministry, and she's really a leader among the community, and we were able to start meeting with her and her family and start sharing the Bible stories with her. We'd go visit her every week, and we've just been faithfully sharing with her for only three years, and finally, about two months ago, she decided she wanted to give her life to Jesus, and we were able to baptize her in the community, in front of the whole community, and she's able to testify what God has done in her life. The hope would be one day to be able to see Embera missionaries be sent out to their villages and share the gospel, share the God stories with people so they can have enough information to follow Jesus. And we just want to thank you all for giving to the body of offering because without that we wouldn't be able to do what we do we're able to focus on our ministry we don't have to worry about raising support and we're able to really just dedicate all of our time to sharing the good news with people who have never heard We're doing something a little different this morning. Not just one praise team is going to lead in the worship service this morning, but all the praise teams are going to lead in it this morning. And if you know any of these songs whatsoever, please join in and sing. This is our congregational singing, and let's lift up the name of Jesus Christ in song this morning as we celebrate this Christmas season.
Christmas bells ring them loud with the message bringing peace on the earth, tidings of good cheer. Come carolers, come and join with the angels singing joy to the world. Christmas time is here again. Children, gather around and listen. You'll hear the sound of angels filling the sky, telling everyone Christmas time. Children can be dismissed to Children's Church and at this time.
that's not working. All right. Well, I'm going to be like a Pentecostal preacher then to hold my microphone then this morning. All right. How about that? All right. There we go. All right. We may get a little happy in Jesus today. There we go. All right. All right. Well, listen, last week we talked about the prophetic mission of a man named Simeon in the Bible, and there were only a few verses uh, about him in the Bible, but uh, if you know, have someone in Scripture, he was a significant person in the account of the life of the Lord Jesus Christ. You might remember last week that I shared with you three things about Simeon, that first of all, he was a righteous man. Uh, the Bible says he was righteous before the Lord. And then the second thing I'll call your attention to is he was a receiving man. That was that he received a message from the Lord through the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And then third, he was a revealing man because the Bible says that he revealed a message uh, to Mary and Joseph. As a matter of fact, the promise that Simeon had received from the Lord was an interesting promise because the Bible says that uh, the Spirit of God told Simeon that he would not see death until he witnessed and saw the Christ child. Now, that is a powerful uh, promise from the Lord uh, himself to Simeon. And the Bible says this about Simeon. The Bible says that Simeon was waiting for what is called the consolation of Israel. Now, that word consolation I mentioned to you last week was the word for comfort. So Simeon was waiting for the comfort of Israel. And that, of course, would be the Christ child. In the monitor, I don't know if I'm loud there, so if we can get that turned down. You tell. You good? Always good to me, you know. That's what they say. That's all right. We're talking about Simeon. Can I get that? All right, good deal. So we don't know a whole lot more about him in the Bible, but what we do know about him is the prophecy that he gave to Mary and Joseph. And I want you to be reminded of that prophecy that he gave Mary and Joseph. He said this, that when he took the Christ child in his hands and he blessed God, he said this, this child would be for the fall of many and also would be for the rise of many in uh, all of Israel and all of the world. You say, well, what is that talking about? Well, what that's talking about is Simeon was telling Mary and Joseph that Jesus, the Christ child, that Jesus, the Christ child, that many people would reject him as Savior and also many people would receive him as Savior. So if we understand the scripture correctly, and we use this verse in our Sunday school class this morning in Matthew chapter 7 where Jesus said, uh, that Christ said that many of you will say, Lord, Lord, but many of you will not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Many will go into a place called hell, but only a few will go into the kingdom of heaven. And Simeon is telling Mary and Joseph that this child, this Messiah, this Christ child, this coming one, this consolation of Israel, this comfort of all of Israel, many people are going to reject him and many people are going to receive him as Savior. Now, this morning in Sunday school, before we started Sunday school, I, I, I made a statement to our Sunday school class, and I'm always reading, always doing research, always looking at uh, Christian material and studying for a Sunday school lesson or studying for a message, whatever it might be. And I came across a survey, and I thought the survey was interesting because here's what the survey said. Next Sunday is what day? Christmas. It is on December 25th. It is Christmas Sunday morning. And here's what the survey said. Only, got to get this. Only 84% of Protestant churches in America planned on having services on Christmas Day. Now, only 84% said, well, that's a pretty good majority. Well, dear friends, I think it ought to be 100%. If Pastor David has his way of saying anything, of any day that you ought to be in God's house, there ought to be two of them, you ought to be in God's house on Christmas Day and on Easter. Could I get an amen to that? You say, now, wait a minute, if you don't see me next week, Brother David, I'm still opening my presence, you know, and I, we're still having all this thing. Listen, no excuse. I expect to see each and every one of you here unless you are uh, six foot under the ground. I expect to see you here in God's house on East or Christmas Sunday morning. Amen? Today we're looking at, not Simeon, but today we're looking at a lady or woman named Anna. She's not mentioned in any of the other gospel accounts. She's not mentioned in Matthew's gospel. She's not mentioned in Mark's gospel, and she's not mentioned in John's gospel. She's only mentioned here in Luke's gospel, 
in Luke chapter 2, verse 36 through 38. But what I want to call your attention to is she's not here by accident. This woman that we're going to learn about today had a very important part in the revealing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pick it up in verse number 36. And I think I've got the scripture verse. If you don't have a copy of scripture, if you don't have it on your phone, it's going to be on the screen in front of you. I normally don't do this, but I did for today. It starts in verse 36. This is the New King James translation. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years, who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. I want us to answer three questions this morning. Three simple questions. Number one is this. Who was Anna? Who was she? Well, the answer is given to us in verse 36 and ther- verse 37. We learn at least three things about Anna. The Bible says that we learn about her name. Her name, Anna. Her name means a grace or graceful one. She was a graceful woman. She was a woman of grace. She was a, a woman that was overflowing with grace. I want you to understand this. We have Anna in the New Testament here in Luke's Gospel, but we also have, that's the New Testament word for a a woman with grace. The Old Testament word for a woman with grace is given to us in 1 Samuel chapter uh, number 1, and that's talking about Hannah. The root word for Anna is the word Hannah, and you remember the story or the account of Hannah uh, in the Bible in 1 Samuel chapter 1. You remember that Hannah uh, was barren uh, from, uh, from the Lord, and the Lord had not opened up her womb, and, and there she was praying one day, and, and as she was praying, her mouth was moving, but there were no words coming out of her mouth, and Eli, the priest, recognized that, and he thought that Hannah was drunk with wine. But she said that I'm not drunk with wine. She was really burdened for heart because God had closed up her womb. But she had prayed that God would open up her womb. So Hannah was a woman of grace. In the New Testament, Anna was also a woman of grace. I think there's a verse of Scripture that would go along with her. This is not going to be on the screen. And that is that great Proverbs 31 passage of Scripture as we talk about the virtuous woman. Proverbs 31, 29, and 30 says this, Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. Charm is deceitful, beauty is passing, but a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Now I want you to notice what happens here in verse number 36. We learn about her name, but we also learn something else about her. The Bible says that she was a prophetess. Now what does that mean? Uh, Well, what it does not mean is it doesn't mean that she was a foreteller of future events. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that she was like an Old Testament prophet like Ezekiel or Isaiah or Jeremiah or one of the major or the minor prophets in the Old Testament. But she was someone that what we understand that was someone who spoke the word of God. You say, well, what did she speak and who did she speak the word of God to? Well, everyone just listen up for just a moment. This is all history for you. Uh, She may have been a teacher of the Old Testament to the younger women uh, in the community. Now, the Bible speaks about that. We really don't know, but we can suspect that this may have been a part of what she did. Now, there's only about five women in the Bible that were identified as prophetesses, if I can say that correctly. Anna was one of them, but you also might remember in the New Testament that there was a man named Philip, and the Bible says that Philip had four daughters that prophesied as well. Now, I want you to understand something. That was not given an allowance for women to be preachers or women to be pastors. That simply says because we don't know any more about Philip's four daughters, the only thing that we know about them is they spoke the word of God, and that's what Anna did here. The New Testament passage of Scripture, listen to what this verse says. You can jot down this reference in Titus chapter 2. The Scripture says, But as for you, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. Notice what he says. The older women likewise... That they be reverent in behavior, not slanders, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. That they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, homemakers, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be blasphemed. Now, Titus was simply saying this. Paul was saying this to Titus. He was not demeaning women. What he was saying is this. There is a ministry for women and there is a ministry for men. I believe that the older men in the church ought to mentor the younger men in the church. Would you say amen to that? And I believe that the older women in the church ought to mentor the younger women in the church. Would you say amen to that? I do not believe that an older man ought to mentor a younger woman. 
And I do not believe that an older woman ought to mentor a, a younger man. I think the Bible is very clear uh, about that. But she spoke the word of God. That is what her name meant. She is a graceful woman. But not only her name, but notice her location. It tells us about her location there in verse 36 as well. It says there was one Anna, the prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel. She was tri- from the tribe of Asher. Everybody look up here for just a moment. Listen up for just a moment. You need to know a little bit of your Old Testament history. Solomon was the wisest man from what the Scripture says. Solomon was a blessed man from God. The Bible says that Solomon had anything and everything that he could ever had that God had blessed him with. But the Bible also says that after King Solomon died, that there was a split in the kingdom and a split in Israel. And uh, Jer- or Rehoboam, his son, uh, wanted to be king. And Jeremo- Jeroboam, his officer, wanted to be king. So therefore there was a split in Israel. And that's the reason why we have what is called the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had ten tribes. That is what is called Israel. The southern kingdom had two tribes, and we call that Judah. Jerusalem is located in Judah. And there was a split in the kingdom. The Bible says here that Anna was from the tribe of Asher. Therefore, Anna was from the northern tribe. Anna was from the tribe who was exiled underneath the Babylonian captivity and later would return uh, to Israel or to Judah and then would reign. So the northern kingdom, they had bad kings. It just said bad king after bad king. The southern kingdom, they didn't do much better. They had some good kings, but they also had some bad kings. But Anna was from the northern kingdom and the tribes of Asher. So what's that have to say do with anything? Well, I believe that Luke was sharing this information to tell us, and please hear this, that even though you might have a questionable upbringing, God can still use you. Amen? So that is her name. That is her location. But the thing I know you're all wanting to get to here in verse number uh, 37 is that uh, she talked about her age. The Bible says that she was a woman of great age. Uh, It says there in verse 36, she was of great age and lived with her husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple. Now, what do we know about her? And I looked at several translations. My translation says that she was of great age. Uh, One translation says that she was very old. One translation said that she was advanced in years. One translation said that she was well along in age. But not one translation said she was an old woman. Can I get a name into that? She was well advanced in years. You say, well, how, long, how old was she? Well, the Bible tells us, gives us information. She'd been married to her husband for seven years, and then she became a widow. She remained a widow the remainder of her life. Some would suggest, the New American Standard Translation suggests that she was 84 years old when they brought Jesus to the temple to be dedicated. But I don't think that's a correct uh, analogy. I don't think that's a correct age because if she had been a widow of 84 years, and her husband had died, and she never married again. So let's figure this out. Let's just think for a minute that she got married when she was 13. Because that wouldn't be uncommon at that day and time. 13, 14 years old. So let's think that she got married when she was 13. She lived with her husband for seven years. That would make her what, church? 20. I'm glad that you're listening on in. And then the Bible says she was a widow for 84 years after that. So in somewhere, some shape or form, some would say, well, I'm going to argue with you that she was 84. And some would say, well, I'm going to argue with you that she was 104 years old. It doesn't really make a difference if she was 84 or she was 104. Here's what the difference is. The difference is that she was not going to die until she saw the Christ child, that she was going to be a blessing and bless other people with the message that she was going to share. So number one question, who was she? Question number two is this, what did she do? Look at verse number 37, the second part of verse number 37. First part says the woman was a widow of about 84 years, and here's what she did. She did not depart from the temple, but she served God with fastings and prayers night and day. She didn't depart from the temple, but she served the Lord with fasting and prayers night and day. And day. Let me give you a couple things here about this. I think it'd be on the next screen if you want to go ahead and go to the next next screen. Three things about her. Number one, she was a fixture at the temple. The Bible says that she never left. She was there every day. Everybody say every day. 
She never left. She may have even lived within the temple uh, complex, the temple wall, on the wall, or uh, in the area of the temple complex. She never left the temple. She was a fixture there. Everyone saw Anna every day when they went to the temple. Number two, she faithfully served the Lord. That's what the verse says here in this passage of Scripture. She did not depart from the temple, but she served God. Now, you say, well, what is involved in being faithful to the Lord? What is involved in serving the Lord? Can I say this to you, dear friends? I wish this, I wish I originated with this, uh, originated this statement, but I, I did not do it. I came, I came across it the other day when I was studying as we talk about faithfulness. Get this. It's not going to be on the screen. 90% of faithfulness is just showing up. Do you get that? If you, don't, if you don't get anything, get that. 90% of faithfulness is just showing up. We, we pack boxes for Operation Christmas Child, and uh, we have 60 or 70 people that just show up. You just show up. Just showing up showing, is showing that you want to be faithful to the task, whether or not what you did or, or anything, but you just want to show up. But what does it mean to be faithful to the Lord? Here the Bible says she was there every day, and then she served God. But how does she serve the Lord? How can you serve the Lord? Let me give you three real quick things here. These are not going to be on the screen. Everybody say, ready? Ready? All right, three quick things. Number one, availability. Number two, teachability. And number three, flexibility. Now let me just walk through those real quick. Number one, availability. You want to be faithful to God? Make yourself available to God. Can I get a witness here this morning? Lord, here I am. Here I am. That's what Isaiah said. Lord, here I am. Send me. Make yourself available to God. You say, well, my, my place is too, you know, it's too full. I've got too many things going on in my life. Let me just ask you a question, dear friends. Look at things going on in your life. Evaluate them. Are the majority of things that are going on in your life, do many of those things have nothing to do with the kingdom of God? Now, let me, I'm going to be very honest with you. I know you can't come to church and be here 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I know you can't, you can't do that, but you can faithfully serve the Lord. You can come to God's house. You can uh, show up to God's house. You can make yourself available. And when you show up to make yourself available, the second thing is that you're teachable. Learn something new every day. I've been a Christian for almost 50 years, and it seems like I'm learning something new every day. New and different. The Bible says this in the book of Hebrews. It said the Word of God is living and powerful. It is a living document. You say, well, how can I learn something new from the Lord every day? Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Teachability. I'm always learning. I got my master's degree when I was 50 years old. Takes you three years. A master's degree is a three-year degree. It took me 14 years to get a three-year degree. That's the honest truth. But I got my master's degree when I was 50 years old, and we walked the line there at Moody Graduate School, and there were other guys who were much older than me who had gone and got their master's degree. And, and I wanted to, I thought, well, you know what? I want to teach at a Bible college or seminary at some point in time, so I'm going to go on and I'm going to get my doctorate degree. And then I changed my mind about that. didn't feel like that's what the Lord wanted me to do and pursued a couple opportunities several years ago. And just, the Lord just didn't open that up for us. And, but what I want to tell you is this. You don't have to have a master's degree. You don't have to have a doctor's degree. But you do need to be teachable. In a Sunday school setting, in a Bible study setting, in a church setting, in a devotional setting, open your heart up. Listen, don't open your mind up to the things of the world. Open your mind and your heart up to the things of God. And allow Him to teach you whether you're 25 or 85, you can still learn something from the Lord. And then flexibility. Flexibility. What does that mean to be flexible? If you ever go on a mission tri trip, listen to me, ch church. If you ever go on a mission trip, whether it's here in the States, here in Barron County, or somewhere across the world, the number one thing you need to learn is to be flexible. You have one idea about what you think you're going to do, but God will teach you something completely different, and he wants to mold you and to make you and he, what he wants you to be. So she was a fixture at the temple. She was faithful in serving the Lord. But notice what happens also here in this verse. She did it by fasting and praying night and day. Now, praying is something that we do. Fasting is something, a practice that many of us do not do. Now, I'm not going to get into all the details about it as far as the physical part of that, as far as what some people can and cannot do. Some people are not able to do that because of physical issues that they have uh, going on in their life, and that's, I'm not going to get into that. But what she did is when she fasted and prayed, that was talking about her worship of the Lord. It says that she was in the temple day and night serving God 
with fastings and prayers night and day. Now, everybody listen up for just a moment. And I won't go on here in just a second. Fasting and praying deals with two, two things. It deals with your need and your dependence. Fasting and praying deals with your need and your dependence. It is a religious experience. Jesus even speaks to it. Jot this reference down in Matthew chapter, five, uh, chapter 6, verse 5 and 6. Jesus said, when you pray. He didn't say when you thought about praying. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. They love to pray standing in the synagogues on the corners of the streets that they might be seen by men. Surely I say to you, they have the reward. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you shut the door, pray to your father who's in a secret place, and your father who's in secret will reward you openly. That is praying. Anna prayed. But she also fasted. Jesus spoke about fasting. Matthew chapter 6, verse 16 through 18. In chapter 5, 6, verse 5 and 6, he said, when you pray. In chapter 6, verse 16, he said, when you fast. So it is a religious practice. God, uh, Jesus is expecting us to do this. He said, don't be like the hypocrites. So when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites. When you fast, don't be like the hypocrites. And he said, with a sad, sad countenance. For they disfigure the faces that they might appear to be fasting to men. As surely I say to you, they have the reward. That's a, a, a reward here. But when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but your Father who sees in secret will also, your Father will reward you openly. Everybody listen up for just a so second. Prayer and fasting. Here's what I understand about prayer and fasting. Number one, prayer has to do with power, and fasting has to do with provision. Let me just explain that for just a moment. Prayer has to do with power. You say, well, what kind of power? Spiritual power. What kind of power? Spiritual warfare power. How many of you understand that the church is under attack today? How many of you understand that Christianity is under attack today? How many of you understand that? Listen, we could do what we do without praying, fasting, or asking the request of the Holy Spirit of God, and we seem to do well with the church and function well. But I'm here to tell you, you can't do anything for God without the influence and empowerment of the Holy Spirit of God. And that's the reason why the church needs to get on our face and we need to start praying like we've never prayed before because the world is on attack. They are wanting our children. They are wanting our grandchildren. They are wanting to come in and take over. They want to come in and, and dictate what we can say and what we can pray and what we can preach about. But dear friends, Jesus said it this way, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell will never prevail against my church. So it's not your church. It's not my church. It's his church. And he's going to empower it, but he empowers it through prayer. And we're under attack. The church is under attack. Not just our church, but all churches that are trying to strive to do what God has called them to do. But fasting has to do with our provision. You see, power comes through praying, but provisions come by fasting. You say, well, why do we fast anyway? Well, the reason why you fast is not to get something from the Lord. The reason why you fast is to get closer to the Lord. Amen? I, I don't need that meal at breakfast. I don't need that meal at lunch, okay? Then what are you going to fill it with? I'm going to fill it with a time with my Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to take that 30 minutes and spend it with the Lord. So who she was, secondly, what did she do? And third this morning, what did she say? Here's where we get about the witness of Anna. Look at verse 38. Simple verse. What she say? And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption in Jerusalem. Now think about the structure of Luke's gospel. If you go through Luke's gospel, and Luke is going to give you many of the accounts or witnesses that he mentions relating to the Messiah, you might go back and look that the angel Gabriel came and gave a witness because he spoke to Mary about the birth of Christ. You go back to Matthew's gospel and you find out that the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 and about the birth of Christ. And you go back and you find that the angel of God spoke to some lowly shepherds out in the field about the birth of Christ. And the Bible says, let us go and witness this miracle. You look in the Bible and the Holy Spirit speaks to Simeon in Luke chapter 2 about the consolation or the comfort of Israel. And now you look here in Luke chapter 2 and the Holy Spirit speaks to Anna about the coming redemption 
of Jerusalem. The word redemption is an interesting word. It means salvation. When Jesus came, dear friends, he came to save. The Bible even says that in Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, when the Spirit of God is speaking to Joseph, and he says this, For he, Jesus, will save his people from their sins. You know what that means? That means that Christ came to rescue you. Amen? He came to rescue you from your sins. But I want you to notice the text here. I'm just about done. Hang in there. Verse 38. The choir's staying a little bit long, so I'm going to preach a little bit long this morning. Verse 38. In coming in that instant. What instant? Well, you've got to go back and look in verse 27. If your Bibles are open there in Luke chapter 2, let's just go back up and look in verse number 27. Because we find out what happened. We learned about this last week. He came, talk about Simeon, being led by the Spirit into the temple. Are you there in verse 27? And when his parents brought to Christ Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him up in his arms, blessed God, and said, Lord, now you're letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, your, 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 your rescue, your redemption which you prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Verse 34, Simeon blessed him and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and the rising of many in Israel, for a sign will be which is spoken. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Now get this picture. Here's Simeon holding the Christ child, there's Mary and Joseph hearing and receiving the revealed word from Simeon through the work of the Holy Spirit about their child, Jesus Christ, and Anna, who was in the temple every day, just like we learned in Sunday school about Ruth, and Anna just happened to be walking by. That's what that phrase man, it means in that instant. But how many of you understand it wasn't an accident that you just happened to be walking by? Amen? It says, in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord, and spoke of him to all those who look for the redemption or the salvation in Israel. Three things and I'll be done. I've said that three times, but I'm, I'm in it this time. Let's go to the next screen. There's the prophecy of Jesus. She praises God, and then she preaches Jesus Christ. The prophecy of Jesus is recorded what I just read in verse 27 and follow. She praises God, it says there in verse 38, and coming in that instant she gave thanks to the Lord. Now, there are several verses or several chapters in the book of Psalms that talk about giving thanks or giving praise to the Lord. I don't have time to go into all of those, but I did look up what does it mean to give thanks to the Lord. And it's interesting because this is not just a one-time praise. Anna just didn't see the Christ child and say, praise God, there's Jesus. She didn't do that. The, the in intention of it is it is continuous praise. So you can get the excitement in Anna when she sees Christ, uh, the Christ child, and there Simeon is blessing him and, and prophesying about him. Here comes Anna in that instant, and she sees the Christ child, and she breaks out into continuous praise. The word also means public praise to God. It means unashamed praise to God. It means glorifying praise to God. Now, everybody, I just want you to hear my heart this morning. I love music. I love good singing, and I love great worship, all right? I love all that. I think that's a precursor. I think that sort of sets the stage for the message of the gospel. Um, some of us like one style. Some of you like another style. Some of you wish that we did something. If you go to a third world country, they don't have speakers. They don't have microphones. They don't have all this sound equipment, they don't have a sound board. They don't have three or four people working all that stuff. All they have is a, is a Home Depot bucket that they turn upside down and they find a stick, a tree stick somewhere, and they use that for a drum to start a beat, and they lift up their hands and they praise the Lord. Can I get a witness here this morning? Now, I may not be advocating that, but that may be what happens. I don't know. You'll have to see when we get to our new building what that's going to look like. But she gave glorifying praise to God. Here's my encouragement. If you're singing in church, and it's a song that God speaks to your heart about, and you want to feel free to lift up your hands to the Lord in praise and thank Him, you go right ahead and do that. Amen? Don't worry about your neighbor. Don't worry about that person behind you that may, uh, you know, you're blocking their view from the screen or whatever it might be. You just give continuous praise to God Almighty. Amen? 
What do you think you're going to be doing when you get to heaven? You're going to be giving praise to God. So she praises the Lord. She gives thanks to the Lord. And then she preaches Christ. She said, well, where do you see that? It says she spoke of him to not some, but all. She preaches Christ. The Bible tells us here in verse 36 that she was a prophetess. We know that she taught the word of God, that she spoke about the word of God. And one person said it this way. She had a personal encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. And upon having that personal encounter with Christ, she goes out and gives a presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I want you to hear that. She has a personal encounter with Christ. What does she do? She goes out and she gives a presentation of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know what she was on? She was on an evangelistic mission for Christ. She was willing to tell everyone about Jesus Christ. Let me give you a few verses of Scripture just to prove my point. Mark chapter 5, the gathering demoniac. Go home to your people, Jesus said, and report to them what things the Lord has done for you and how he had mercy on you. And he went away and he began to proclaim. There's his witness. He began to proclaim in the Decapolis what great things Jesus had done for him. And everyone was amazed. Paul said it this way to the Thessalonian church. He said, you also became imitators of us. And the Lord, having received the word in much tribulation with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For Listen to what he says. For the word of the Lord has sounded forth from you. And not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place that your faith toward God has gone forth. Listen to what he says. So we don't have to say anything. They witnessed about Christ. John chapter 4. The woman left the water pot, went her way into the city and said to the men, Come and see a man who told me all the things that I ever did. Could this be the Christ? What did she do? She had a personal encounter with Jesus. What did she do? She went out and made a presentation of the gospel. And then in 1 John chapter 1, John said it this way. That which was from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen with our own eyes, which we've looked upon, which our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was from the Father and was manifested to you that we, which we have heard and which we have seen. Here's what he says. We declare to you. That you also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with the Son, Jesus Christ. And these things we write that your joy might be full. Let me ask you a question, dear friend. Have you had a personal encounter with Jesus? Because if you've had a personal encounter with Jesus, you're going to give a presentation of the message of the gospel. Amen? And that is a natural thing. You said, now, wait a minute, I haven't got that. That's what the preacher's job is. That's what the deacon's job is. That's what the leadership's job is. That's what the missionary's job is. No, when you've had a personal encounter with Jesus, dear friends, you are forever changed, and you are changed so much to the point that you just can't help but to tell someone about that change. So what was it that defined Anna? What was it that defined her? Was it her family? No. Was it her heritage? No. Was it her age? No. Was it her status? Because the Bible says she was a widow. I think I've got it. What defined her is what she did once she witnessed the Christ. What defines you? You know what defines you? What you do once you have an encounter with Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Some of you that are still working. Do people at your job know that you're a believer and a follower of Christ? How about in your community? How about your neighbors? Do they know that you are a follower and a believer, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I don't know. They just see me get in my car every Sunday morning. And I guess they anticipate and expect me to, uh, that I'm going to church. I don't, I don't know. Do they know? Does people in your family know that you are a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ? Can I make a little upset this morning? Find out where you are next Sunday morning. We'll find out if you're a follower. Ew. I said, preacher, you can't do that. Oh, I did. Paul said it this way in Romans chapter 1. He said, I am in debt. He said, I am under obligation both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul said, for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also 
who are in Rome. Paul said, I have a debt, and my debt is to both Jews and Gentiles. And that debt, he said, I owe to every lost person. And to every lost person, the debt that I owe to them here in our community and beyond is to let them know that Jesus Christ came, and he came for one reason, and that was to die for their sin. Amen? I want to close with two powerful quotes that really just pierced my heart. First one is this. They're not mine, but they're good. Quote, every saved person this side of heaven owes the gospel to every lost person this side of hell. End quote. Just let that drive in to your heart. One more quote. The injustice of the Christian life is that we possess the gospel and we refuse to give our lives to making it known among those who haven't heard. What an injustice. You've got the message of Jesus Christ in your heart as your personal Savior and Lord, and you see people out in our community, you talk to them, you talk to them about the ball game, you talk about the bowl games, you talk to them about the grocery prices, you talk to them about everything under the sun, but you fail to talk to them about Jesus. Dear friends, listen, you are identified by whether or not you've had a personal encounter with Jesus. And if you've had a personal encounter with Jesus, then you will give a presentation of the message of Christ. Amen? So we're down here at the church building, and I go down there, like I told you a couple weeks ago, I go down there multiple times a day. They probably get tired of seeing me. I mean, I walk around, and, and as I'm walking around, I'm praying. You know, I'm praying. I don't know where stuff's going to be or whatever it might be, and I'm praying. I'm talking. Our job superintendent is a, a believer in Christ, goes to one of our local churches, sings and pray, plays on the worship team at a local church, strong believer, 27-year-old man, and sold out for Jesus. His boss is a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. And he takes part in his local church just up the road here just a few miles. And he's very active in, in his local church. The guy who's heading up the electrical job out there, I found out, is a preacher. And he preaches at two little churches down in Warren County somewhere. I hadn't had a chance to really talk to him a whole lot. But we got to talking the other day. And you can tell that you have a kindred spirit with somebody. So, dear friends, so as... as as we are walking on that job site, as we are observing the HVAC unit going in, as we are observing the drywall being taped to mud, as we are watching uh, these guys up on, sta uh, on the scaffolding, pulling wire and things of that nature, we've got people with their hands on this information, on this material, and they're believers in Christ. They want this church to be all that God wants it to be. How about you? Not a building, but a church. The body of Christ. Amen? I had a personal encounter with the Lord. I'm done, by the way. I promise. No, I don't promise. I had a personal encounter with the Lord. And after I had a personal encounter with the Lord, the first person I told was my mom. My pastor said, you need to start telling people about this new commitment that you've made to Christ. And I was innocent enough to believe him. I was a new convert, and I just started telling people. I went to work. I got saved Sunday at church. I went to school. I got saved Sunday at church. I, I went to events and, and raised in a Catholic. I wasn't raised in a Catholic home. All my dad's side of his family's all Catholic. We went to everything. Went to baptisms, went to funerals, went to, uh, com you know, whatever it was. Went to all kinds of things in the Catholic church. And I'd tell people, I'd, you know, the priest would be there drinking and telling some of the worst jokes along, and I'd tell him, I said, I'm, I got saved. He'd look at me like, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. Here I am almost 50 years later, and I want to tell you about my Jesus. He is sweeter today than the day that I met him. I want to be closer to him today than I've ever been in my life. And I want to tell more people about Jesus today than I've ever done in my entire life. And I pray that for our church. Amen? Because that's what a mark, an identity of a local church is. If you've had an encounter with Christ, you will make a presentation of the gospel. It is by no accident that we are on a hill. For Jesus says, let your light so shine. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we love you. We praise you. <clears throat> We'd ask for your sweet Holy Spirit to speak to our hearts today.
If there is a man, woman, boy, or girl downstairs that has yet to come to faith, someone here in this room, I pray today that they have heard the gospel and they'll respond to Christ. Lord, if there's something else within our life that we need to get some things right, Lord, I pray whatever that decision is, this altar is open for anyone that would come. And God, I just thank you so much for the opportunity to tell others about Jesus. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We're going to stand and sing not an invitation hymn, but another Christmas song. So why don't you all stand as we sing. If you need to come, please. It came upon the midnight clear, that glorious song. We praise you, Lord God. We thank you for today. Oh, Lord, would you just miss us, Lord, with your blessing. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You all are dismissed.